Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 823 for June 14th, 2020. Coming up in a few minutes. The bourbon industry has gotten comfortable with just saying like, oh, everybody wants to work for the brand. Let's just throw it out on Facebook or let's throw it out on LinkedIn and everybody comes to us. But the truth is when it comes to DNI, when it comes to really seeking the talent you want, you've got to go and get it. Samara Rivers is the founder of the Black Bourbon Society, which has 17,000 members around the United States. A week ago, she issued an open letter to the American whiskey industry, calling on distillers and brands to commit to diversity in the wake of the ongoing protests over racism and police brutality. While some of the initiatives announced by the industry this week had been in the planning stages before that letter, their timing shows a serious commitment to change among many of the industry's leaders. I'll talk with Samara Rivers later on Whiskey Cast in depth. We'll also have the What I'm Tasting This Week department, the latest event updates, and on Behind the Label, we'll look at what a whiskey blender does when her blending lab is closed because of COVID-19. It's all ahead on this week's Whiskey Cast. When you land on something special, you just know. Redbreast, the quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey and a proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. From far beyond the wall comes a whiskey for those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Let's get started with the news. It's brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. While protests over police brutality against African Americans continue, a number of whiskey companies are stepping forward to put their money and resources into improving diversity within the whiskey industry. The story of the friendship between Nathan Nearest Green and Jack Daniel, 150 years or so ago, has been told many times in recent years. But it's the focus of a new partnership between Uncle Nearest Tennessee Whiskey and Jack Daniels. The Nearest and Jack Advancement Initiative is a new $5 million program that will be centered around the Nearest Green School of Distilling that's being established at Tennessee's Motlow State Community College. Both companies have worked to create the curriculum for a program aimed at training people of color to enter the distilling industry, which Uncle Nearest founder Fawn Weaver admits has been a hard sell in the past. African Americans will not naturally look at the whiskey business as being something they want to get into because I think of the history of how African Americans were in the beginning with distilling as slaves. And then as time went on, being in the roles that were not, uh, let's call it the suit and tie role. And so I think because of that, it's not something that we've really been drawn to or attracted to. And so now we have the task of going in and telling women and people of color, hey, this is a great industry. You should give this a look and to get it to a place where people really want to get involved. The school has been in the works for more than a year. Motlow State President Dr. Michael Torrance hopes to begin classes in the fall of 2021 once the state's Board of Regents and regional accreditors sign off on the program. It'll not only focus on the nuts and bolts of making whiskey, but also the history. That is very a very, very important component of this, that the culture and the history of this is also a part of the program. And, you know, stands where we are today in terms of our social climate and the nation, um, this would be important because of the relationship that Jack and Nearest had. And it is one of those relationships that has bore something that is of quality, uh, that has lasted uh, and, and has been strong enough to last it for the test of time. And it's a representation of this is what happens when we work together. Uh, here's the outcome. Uh, and and I, again, I speak to that partnership with uh, 
Jack Daniel and Uncle Mears in Mott State. The initiative will also include professional development programs with a mentorship program aimed at helping African-American entrepreneurs develop their own spirits brands, along with a career advancement program for people of color already in the industry, as Jack Daniel's global brand director, Matt Blevins, told me. We are taking people of color who are in the industry primarily and uh, bringing them into career path acceleration around head distillers, um, general management of distilleries and other senior positions uh, in the companies. And and by the way, I think that can have um, opportunity outside of our own companies into the entire industry. So very excited uh, about what that can grow into, but we will be an active participant in uh, hiring and mentoring Other distilleries have already expressed interest in becoming part of the career development program as well. We have more details on the entire initiative in the news section at WhiskeyCast.com. Friday, Diageo unveiled its own initiative, the $20 million Diageo Community Fund that will support African-American communities and black-owned businesses in the hospitality industry, to help them recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. That's in addition to a million dollars in support for the NAACP, the National Urban League, and 100 Black Men of America and their racial equality and social justice programs. Campari America is donating $300,000 to the Equal Justice Initiative, while the Kentucky Distillers Association kicked off a second round of its Kentucky Bourbon Affair online charity auction this week. Proceeds from the second round will go to the Brianna Taylor Memorial Scholarship Fund at the University of Louisville. In addition, the KDA is establishing scholarships for minority students interested in studying distilling at the University of Kentucky, the University of Louisville, and Kentucky State University. We'll have more on that later on. In other news, we are now starting to see some of the major distilleries in Kentucky reopening slowly to visitors following COVID-19 related lockdowns. While the state's reopening plan allowed distilleries to begin offering tours and tastings starting last Monday, they are easing into it. Heaven Hill is opening its Evan Williams Bourbon Experience in Louisville and the Bourbon Heritage Center in Bardstown Thursdays through Sundays at first, with only six people allowed on each tour. Four Roses will open its gift shop at the distillery in Lawrenceburg starting this coming Wednesday through Saturday, but with no tours or tastings for now. The visitor center at Four Roses' Cox's Creek Warehouse and bottling facility near Bardstown remains closed for now. Angel's Envy in Louisville has opened its gift shop only, with no tours or tastings as of yet. Last time around, we reported that a change was likely for this year's Kentucky Bourbon Festival in Bardstown, and that change was announced late Tuesday afternoon. This year's festival will be postponed until the weekend of October 15th through the 18th. While Bourbon Festival President Randy Prosso still believes this year's event can be held safely, The COVID-19 lockdowns have taken a couple of months out of the planning process with participating distilleries all shut down. When mid-March hit, most of the distilleries were just, they just ground to a halt with regards to any of their public promotions. Obviously, the visitor centers and the tours screeched to a halt. And we just, no, no one in particular that I would single out, but they all basically just said, look, if you're coming to us right now for a decision on will you be involved in September or will you be involved in October, the overwhelming consensus was just October just makes everyone feel a little bit more comfortable with with moving forward with this kind of thing. As of now, many of the distilleries that usually take part in the Bourbon Festival have still not committed to holding events this year. The final schedule of events will not be released until mid-July. You can listen to my entire interview with Randy Prosser in the news section at WhiskeyCast.com. One other COVID-19 note, we have mentioned the U.S. Bartenders Guild Foundation's Bartender Emergency Assistance Program, 
and its fundraising campaign to help bartenders and other bar workers laid off during the pandemic. The foundation has awarded 27,500 grants of up to $500 each to help cover emergency expenses, but it will not accept new applications after midnight Pacific time on Monday. The foundation has $8.5 million right now in committed donations, but that's only enough to pay for 30,000 grants. It would take $18 million to cover grants for every eligible applicant so far, and the pace of donations has slowed to a trickle in recent weeks. Turning now to Scotland, we could see hospitality businesses there start to reopen on July 15th. But with severe social distancing restrictions still in place, pubs and restaurants will still have to keep patrons two meters apart under current policy. Groups representing pub owners say most of the country's pubs would not be able to reopen with a two-meter standard, and they're asking the Scottish government to allow one-meter social distancing instead. That's the standard the World Health Organization has been recommending, and it's also being considered by the British government for pubs in England. In Ireland, we reported a couple of weeks ago that Teeling Whiskey Company in Dublin had reopened its distillery shop and cafe. Teeling announced this week that two weeks from now, tours and tastings will resume on June 29th. There's also another big change in Ireland. Irish distillers master distiller Brian Nation is leaving Middleton Distillery to move to the United States. He's agreed to join the startup O'Shaughnessy Distillery in Minneapolis after seven years as Middleton's master distiller. He took over from longtime master distiller Barry Crockett back in 2013. Kevin O'Gorman has been named the new master distiller and will also continue as Middleton's master of maturation. The move caught him by surprise, as he told me this week. Basically, it's it's only in the, the last uh, I suppose number of number of days, um, a week or so, uh, when all of this was uh, finalized. And um, you know, I was I, I, I didn't take long to I was asked to think about it. Uh, to be honest, I didn't I didn't spend too long dwelling on it. Um, it was something that really excited me, and I, I, I jumped at it. To be honest. So, what does it mean to you to follow in the lineage of uh, Max and Barry Crockett? Brian and all the other master distillers over the years at Middleton. Uh, look, Mark. I mean, you know, reflecting on this yesterday. Um, look, it, it's an honor. Um, it's a privilege. Um, it really is. It's it's one of the most coveted uh, jobs in, in the whiskey world. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Um, I'm very much aware of the history and tradition going back to 1780 and John Jemison. It's going back a long way. So. I'd be very much aware of the traditional heritage, and it, it, it's thrilling. Um, you know, a little bit uh, um, frightening in some ways as well, but I'm really looking forward to it, and I just can't wait to, to, to get stuck in. We'll catch up with Brian Nation once he gets settled in in his new job. Two years ago, we reported on William Grant and Sons entering the bourbon market with a fistful of bourbon as a Texas exclusive. Now distribution is being expanded nationwide. You'll find my tasting notes for it at whiskeycast.com. Canada's Forty Creek Distillery is celebrating its 20th anniversary this year with a special commemorative edition of Forty Creek Three Grain. It was one of the distillery's two original releases back in 2000, and this release will be the final one ever for Three Grain. It'll be available exclusively at Ontario's LCBO stores and the Forty Creek Shop starting in September. Along with this year's limited edition release, Resolve would normally have gone on sale at Forty Creek's annual Whiskey Weekend in September, but there's no word on whether the event can be held this year because of COVID-19, and that means collectors will not be able to reserve bottles this year. 6,500 bottles of Forty Creek Resolve will be available nationwide in Canada starting in September. And from three grain to three barrel, Ontario's Still Waters Distillery has launched stock and barrel three barrel Canadian whiskey. 
It's a blend of the regular Stillwater's single malt and rye whiskeys with corn whiskey, all matured separately in ex-bourbon barrels and blended after maturation. Stock and barrel three barrel is available exclusively in Canada with a recommended retail price of $35 Canadian a bottle. Douglas Lang & Company has released the Epicurean Edinburgh Edition. It's a special blend that came out of a recent blending competition among Edinburgh bartenders, with 56 North's Lindsay Blair creating the winning blend. Only 600 bottles will be available at whiskey shops in the UK, with a recommended retail price of £50 a bottle. Portland's House Spirits has released its latest edition of Westward Pinot Noir Cask Finished Single Malt. It's finished in casks from Oregon's Suzor Wines and is available in limited amounts for $89.95 a bottle with free shipping available in Oregon through the Westward website. And finally, Adam Park and Dave Broom's Scotch Whiskey documentary, The Amber Light, is finally coming to video on demand. It'll be available on Vimeo On Demand starting June 25th, but only in the UK and Ireland at first. That's a start. They're also going to team up with Royal Mile Whiskies for a private online screening, along with commentary and a whiskey tasting on June 25th, with tasting packs available through Royal Mile Whiskies. Part of the proceeds from sales will go to the Drinks Trust in the UK to help furloughed bar workers there. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. Heaven Hill's Parker Beam made a lot of great whiskeys during his lifetime, and the whiskey that carries his name is carrying on the tradition. The 13th edition of Parker's Heritage Collection just won Best Rye Whiskey Honors and a double gold medal, at the San Francisco World Spirits Competition. It also continues Heaven Hill's commitment to the fight against ALS. Find out more at HeavenHillDistillery.com. Think wisely, drink wisely. Time now for the Whiskey Cast calendar of events brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling. Some event changes to note. The Beer, Bourbon, and Barbecue Festival scheduled for later this month in Timonium, Maryland has now been postponed until the weekend of November 13th and 14th. McTeers has changed its next whiskey auction on July 3rd to an online-only event with no bidders allowed at the auction gallery in Glasgow. The Scotch Whiskey Experience in Edinburgh plans to have its first Scotch Whiskey training school since the pandemic started on July 7th. Though since the experience is still closed to the public as of this weekend, that could change. As of now, it looks like the first public whiskey events to take place will be the Taipei Whiskey Club's Harmony Home Charity Tasting on July 11th in Taipei, Taiwan, along with the Bristol Whiskey and Spirits Festival in England and Bacon and Bourbon 2020 in Charleston, South Carolina, both are set for July 18th. Whiskey Live in Perth, Australia is still on the schedule for August 7th and 8th, along with Whiskies of the World events in San Jose, California on the 7th and San Francisco on the 8th, and Whiskey Fringe in Edinburgh the week of the 7th through the 9th. Remember, these days any event plans are subject to change on short notice, so make sure you check with event organizers before you make any travel plans. We are updating the calendar at WhiskeyCast.com as we get updates. The calendar of events is brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling, makers of Virginia's most awarded spirits. You'll find their Roundstone Rye at fine whiskey shops in 26 U.S. states, and on three continents, along with online. Visit the Where to Buy page at CatoctinCreekDistilling.com to find a retailer near you. And please drink responsibly. From deep in the north, far beyond the wall, the howl of the frozen wind brings word of something new. 
whiskey from the land of always winter. For those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Mortlock. The American whiskey industry's history is not always a proud one when it comes to diversity and inclusion. For instance, it's impossible to talk about George Washington's legacy as one of the leading distillers of his day without remembering that his distillery at Mount Vernon used slave labor, as did many other distilleries before the Civil War. And for every story we hear about the friendship between Nathan Nearest Green and Jack Daniel, there's another story like the one out of Kentucky this weekend. Workers removing a statue of Confederate President Jefferson Davis from the state capitol in Frankfurt Saturday found a time capsule of sorts in the base. The people who installed that statue back in 1936 put the day's edition of the State Journal newspaper and an empty bottle of Glenmore, Kentucky bourbon inside the statue's base. We should note that even though Kentucky remained in the Union during the Civil War, Jefferson Davis was born in Kentucky. His birthplace in Fairview is home to a state historical site. That statue will eventually be moved there. Racism has often been referred to as America's original sin, and the protests over police brutality against African Americans and other people of color show that there is still a lot of work left to do to make equality a reality. The whiskey industry is certainly no exception. The other day, Whiskey Advocate compiled a list of black-owned American whiskey distilleries and brands. Right now, there are around 2,100 distilleries in the U.S. Just 15 distilleries and brands are known to be owned by African Americans. Last Sunday, Black Bourbon Society founder Samara Rivers released an open letter to the whiskey industry in the wake of the protests over the shootings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery. As we reported on the last episode... She called out the industry for largely remaining silent during the protests. She called for not only their words of support, but their actions of support as well. Now, that was before this week's announcements that we reported during the news of the Nearest and Jack Advancement Initiative, Diageo's Community Fund, the $300,000 pledge by Campari, which owns Wild Turkey Bourbon and Glen Grant Scotch Whiskey, and other corporate pledges of support. I talked with Samara Rivers this weekend. It has been a a pretty unusual week after a couple of weeks of uh, a lot of tension and a lot of negative stuff to see some positive things happening. Yeah, um, we've seen the industry really respond to the open letter that we uh, did, and um, it has been very refreshing to see so many brands step up and make statements even if they don't have the answers and we knew that, you know, the, the brands don't have the answers. We're not looking for them to have answers to this issue, but just their willingness to say, you know, Hey, this isn't right. We're standing up in solidarity for um, black lives matter movement for what's going on with, with regards to racial injustice and, and racism in general. And we're, we're, we pledge to figure it out and to be better partners to the Black community. That enough has been very refreshing to see um, over the course of this week. Is it a case of where maybe, the, as you point out, these brands admit they don't have the answers? And maybe yeah. for the past couple of weeks before that, leading up to this, they wanted to listen and figure out where they could make a contribution and where they could be effective instead of... Uh, coming out with uh, basically empty platitudes two weeks ago supporting the Black Lives Matter movement and actually be able to follow it up with some action and some concrete steps and listen to what the community needed rather than uh, just jump in. Um, I think it's a little bit of 
both. I think that there have been some brands that have always been aware that they need to address their African-American audience and they need to make a stand and didn't know how. Um, but I think there's also brands that um, just didn't want to get involved. I think there were also brands that um, because they didn't know how, they did, they just didn't want to touch the subject at all. It's just, okay, we're not even going to acknowledge that this exists. So we're just going to keep on with our regular programming because they just didn't, it just wasn't in their awareness, you know? Um, <laughs> so I, I think it's a mix of both. I know that there are some brands that have uh, really tried to focus their, their efforts around diversity and inclusion for some time. And so I'm, you know, of course, I wasn't shocked to see them come out with statements and immediate um, solutions or, you know, how they plan to handle the situation internally and also, you know, with donating to worthy causes um, outside of their organization. So I was not um, surprised by those brands speaking up and saying something. But the smaller brands, the brands that know they've got a DNI issue, you know, the excuse that we've seen, especially since we started Black Bourbon Society four years ago, is that, well, we don't know how, so we don't at all. And I think that's no longer acceptable. I think now everyone's got to come out of that 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 scary place that, you know, oh, I don't want to offend anybody, so I'm not going to say anything, to, okay, let's figure this out because we've got to do something. We can't turn blinders on anymore. Which brands surprised you? If you want to name names, feel free. Which brands surprised you with their commitment and their lack of commitment this week? Oh, this is such a touchy subject. <laughs> um, I don't think I want to throw brands under the bus because I still think that there's opportunity for them to grow and interchange just because they may not have spoken in this moment does not mean that they may speak in other moments. So I don't think it's fair um, to say which ones have been disappointing um, because I think there's an opportunity. I will say though, if you know, I'm thinking about the brands and the relationships that I, I, I really see opportunity to work with. I will say the reason why I did kick this off was out of um, a conversation that I had with the Kentucky Distillers Association. And I was very disappointed in um, how they were completely tone deaf to the landscape um, that our society was in. And that is the reason why I wrote the open letter, was out of not working with the brands or the lack of movement from the brands per se, but um, truly it was out of the discussions, the, the disheartening conversations that I had with the Kentucky Distillers Association um, that kicked this whole thing off. They have since come back and made a statement. I believe they made their statement on Thursday. I wrote my um, open letter on a Sunday. They they responded um, a couple days later on Thursday in response and have established a Breonna Taylor scholarship fund at the University of Kentucky um, to, you know, go towards uh, the distillers program for African-Americans to, um, to learn and to be more uh, trained and available to take on positions within this, the bourbon industry. Um, and they have some other initiatives. Um, so I will say that was the most disappointing because it kicked, it sparked the fire in me to write the letter. Um, but I am impressed with their decision to create the scholarship fund. And I am um, eagerly waiting to see how that will be executed and um, played out over, you know, the course of the year, how long it will last. Hopefully it's a permanent initiative for the KDA. And hopefully they, as the governing body, I look at them as the governing body for all of the bourbon brands and, and in our industry, especially in Kentucky. I hope that they can um, use their advocacy and their place to encourage the other brands to follow suit. In talking with Eric Gregory, the KDA president, um, a few days ago, they had made the decision just the week before that, because I had asked him specifically about what the KDA was doing on diversity and inclusion. And 
what they had told me was that they had always left that part up to their member companies, to their member distilleries to figure out for themselves because different companies have different abilities when it comes to having large human resources staffs and ability to recruit, things like that. So they had not done it on a statewide basis or an organization-wide basis, but right. they had agreed to form a task force within the KDA board to start looking at industry-wide initiatives. I know you also uh, were not happy a week or so ago when they started a Kentucky Bourbon Affair charity auction and yeah. devoted that money to raising money for COVID-19 research, but they followed up late this, this week. week with a second auction to raise money for a separate Brianna Tiller Scholarship Fund at the University of Louisville. Right. And right. I have to imagine that that makes you at least feel a little better about their response in that regard. Absolutely. And again, you know, the thing that kicked off my um, my disappointment and irritation <laughs> um, with the KDA was the fact that they had requested for me to um, extend that auction to, to donate towards COVID relief um, under such short notice. Um, and it was in conjunction with our retail partner, Westport Whiskey and Wine, which, you know, we, we've worked with for years now, um, doing events and, and doing bottle pickups and, and all of that in Louisville. Um, and so we've got a great relationship with Westport Whiskey and Wine, but really it was the KDA pushing for us to, to do this um, auction and, and raise funds for COVID-19. That was also the day of Brianna Taylor's birthday. And so for me, as an African-American woman that has seen cities all across this country being ripped apart for two weeks, um, still, you know, parading the body of George Floyd down in Houston um, and marching in solidarity as they were preparing to lay his body to rest, it was extremely insensitive to me for, <laughs> for them to ask me, hey, we need you to do this auction. We need you to send it to all, all of your members and we're going to raise money for COVID-19. It was extremely tone deaf. So a week out after we wrote the letter, a week after they have launched their initiatives and on Friday when they finally did announce, okay, this auction is for, Brianna, you know, for the Brianna Taylor Scholarship Fund. Yes, we will proudly support you in that effort and we will send it out to our members because it's more timely. This, it resonates with our audience. This is what we care about in this moment. And so, yeah, I am, I'm, I am glad that they did circle back and, and, and try to make it right. And I will always honor organizations that will circle back and try to make it right. Even if they're a week late, we will always honor it. Let's talk about the extent of your society's reach, because until I saw you and I, we've talked before and we've reported on the Black Bourbon Society before, but I didn't realize until I saw that letter that you have 17,000 members around the U.S. Mm -hmm. I figured a few hundred and 17,000 is a big society. Let's mm -hmm. put this in perspective for those in our audience who weren't aware of that. This represents a significant market share for the industry, doesn't it? Absolutely. Um, African Americans um, spend about $3.5 billion a year on wine, spirits, and tobacco. We are a significant part of the buying power of this industry. And of course, when you look at our percentage, you know, on a national scale, we're only, you know, a small percentage of people in America, but we over index in spending across the board. And so, yes, we do have a lot of buying power. And I think people also have to realize that we have 17,000 members, but each one of our members has their own network of hundreds and thousands of people. And so, for instance, we put it out to our members, but we also put it out to the bartending guild. We also put it out to other organizations, other um, bourbon societies picked up the letter and spread that letter to their audiences. And so our reach really is bigger than that 17,000 um, number that, that we report. Um, just, you know, with the way the social media is set up and the way things go viral, 
um, it's really probably times three or four of that number, maybe even five. One of the things you also called for in your letter was increased diversity within the bourbon and American whiskey companies in terms of hiring. Yes. And that has been a problem for many, many years. We had a discussion on the Wednesday webcast this week with uh, Fawn Weaver from Uncle Nearest. But uh, I want to play you a cut from that webcast. And you'll also hear in there from uh, Brian Tracy of Sagamore Spirit and Adam Spiegel of the Sonoma Distilling Company, because we talked specifically about the need for diversity in hiring and promotion within the industry. So I want you to listen to this for just a second. The biggest issue we have, I think, is actually making this industry cool for us, showing us that this industry has come a long way and it is a great place to be now. But we have to get that message out. I I can go and travel to all of the HBCUs, the historically black colleges, and go to their STEM programs and meet with the students and say, hey, did you know distilling is an issue, is like is an option for you? I can tell you maybe one out of every thousand would say, oh yeah, I thought about distilling, but I doubt it. I think across the board, I don't think I would get anyone who even thought about it. And so there's a multi-prong thing. Uh, we're actually announcing top of the morning. Uh, and you're going to kill me because if I had done this with you on Friday, I could talk about it. But we're announcing a pretty massive initiative tomorrow morning. And we're doing it in conjunction with our friends, Jack Daniels. So oh, come it is, on, Fawn. You can tell I us. I can't. Listen, Lawson Whiting was, uh, was on CNBC yesterday. And and uh, and even he kept it in. So I was like, I got to keep it in, Mark. I can't I can't say what it is, but it is something that I do not believe would have happened in this industry if it weren't for the last two weeks. And so I look at George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, uh, Ahmaud Arbery, everyone that has come in this very short period of time. I think we are going to see very, very soon that their deaths were not in vain. This generation is determined to be the last generation dealing with racism. And it took these three deaths back to back for the entire world to wake up. And for that, I I am grateful. This brings up the question, and Vaughn's concern was that you gotta make this cool for the African-American community to want to work in the bourbon industry because of historical perspectives that uh, may have turned people away in the past. Uh, She also pointed out in that interview that uh, you've had uh, preachers in the black churches for years railing against alcohol use, so that turns some people away who might be good candidates. How do you reach out to the community to make this an industry where people want to apply and want to try to build a career? I think that you know, you have to be intentional in your recruitment. So just posting a link on LinkedIn or sending it through your networks, which may, you know, be in Kentucky or through your staff that is not diverse, is more than likely you're not going to get the candidates you wish to see. So if you're looking for Black talent, African-American talent, Perhaps you should hire a, you know, a multicultural headhunting firm. You know, ha- perhaps we need to do more, build more partnerships with organizations that um, that African Americans are a part of, like uh, the National Black MBA Association, the the you know Masters of Business Association. Black MBA is a great one. There's the National Scientists of Black Engineers, NSBE. Um, there's so many organizations that really do kind of harvest black excellence, black talent, and most corporations like you've got sponsors from P and G or from Clorox, um, even some of the medical device organizations and companies like Medtronic, and Eli Lilly, they know this and they work directly with these organizations to recruit their diverse talent. 
So I think that the bourbon industry has gotten comfortable with just saying like, oh, everybody wants to work for the brands. Let's just throw it out on Facebook or let's throw it out on LinkedIn and everybody comes to us. But the truth is when it comes to DNI, when it comes to really seeking the talent you want, you've got to go and get it. You've got to make the effort and make the intention to get in front of um, these organizations. Because at the end of the day, it's all about access and network. And so if there aren't a lot of African-Americans that have access or that are, are aligned or have networks or friends or community that are associated with the spirits industry, it's not on their radar at all. That's especially true in the bourbon industry because a lot of hiring is done through word of mouth at these yep. distilleries. It's who you know, not what you know. Yep, Exactly. Let's talk about Freddie Johnson, um, our good friend from Buffalo Trace. The exactly. only reason Freddie got his gig was because his father and grandfather had worked there, and his father talked to Mark Brown and helped him get a job. Exactly. But what did Freddie Johnson do before that? He was an engineer living in another state in another city. So he had a very successful career. Yeah. You know, it wasn't until his father got sick and his father asked, you know, and he had to come home to take care of his father, that that position was facilitated for him to come and work for Buffalo Trace as a third generation employee in his family for Buffalo Trace. Um, you know, that's how that position was created for him. But Freddie Johnson is an extremely intelligent man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he, I, I really want people to know that he is an engineer. He's just not a tour guide. Um, but he gave up his career. He gave up his life to move back to Kentucky to be with his family and to and to work with Buffalo Trace. Um, and so that was intentional in itself. And I got to point out, um, if I remember correctly, Freddie's background was either in civil engineering or electrical engineering. It wasn't in chemical engineering, right. which made it hard for him to make the transition to becoming a distiller. Exactly. Exactly. So he didn't have the chemistry knowledge or the so, background yeah. yet. He was a smart guy. But his training was in the wrong field to work in distilling, which is why they moved him into a tour guide position. Right. Exactly. And also because that so, gave him the flexibility to take care of his dad. Right. Right. So that's very specific, you know. Um, but there are, just like there, Freddie Johnson is an engineer, there are plenty of African-American marketing directors across this country. There are plenty of people who have MBAs, who have seven years worth of experience. Um, but again, if it's not in the who you know realm if they're not aware or they don't have ties to anyone in Kentucky or in Tennessee where Uncle Maris is located, then no, they don't they are not aware of those positions. So again, hiring a headhunting firm that can go through and approach people about positions and looking for a black talent, that's a great way to find it. Also, again, working with a nonprofit organizations. Um, you can go through the African American sororities and fraternities looking for black talent. All of those organizations have job boards where African Americans who are part of those organizations have access to that. We've also posted it in our group as well. We haven't really pushed it um, and we haven't really focused on recruitment within our audience. But I think that that becomes a part of the work that we will now do with our new nonprofit organization, Diversity Distilled, which is to help organizations recruit, retain, and promote diverse talent within their organizations. So that there will be more opportunities for us to play a role in that as well. It, does, it didn't fit underneath the mission and vision of Black Bourbon Society. But now that we've got um, the announcement of our new nonprofit, we can totally help organizations like Fawns and Adams, um, Adam, who is a good friend of mine with Sonoma County Distilling. So I'm glad you're talking with him. Um, we can work with their organizations to help them to find talent to fill those positions. Let's talk about diversity distilled because this is not a new initiative that you've been working on. You've been doing this quietly for a while. If mm -hmm. I remember correctly, you were supposed to have a national conference this past yeah. week until yeah. COVID-19 came along. Yep. Yeah. So uh, Diversity Distilled was an organization that we started back in January. And again, out of conversations with the brands um, through Black Bourbon Society, we were realizing that, um, you know, a lot of the diversity and inclusion um, initiatives needed to be done internally instead of externally. So if we just take a step back, Black Bourbon Society was created to help brands 
be able to reach African-American consumers who love whiskey and to really build some genuine connections and helping them with their marketing strategies um, and all of that. So it was more event facing, event, um, event forward, um, consumer forward um, of, an, of an organization, of a, of a business model. Um, working with the brands, we were we found ourselves being the bridge between the brands and the consumer. Um, but as we have, as we are now entering into our four years of doing that and have received much success, we see diversity distilled taking a more insular look at the brands and looking at their DNI structures within the company and seeing how can we influence and leverage and consult and strategize change so those organizations are more diverse. Because the truth is, the brands had an issue reaching out to African-American consumers or consumers of color in general because the people creating the strategies were not diverse. And so when you talk about if you want things to change, you've got to change it from the inside out. And so that's what diversity distilled really wants to do. So we want to look at these brands internally and help them to recruit great talent, diverse talent help them to retain them because we've noticed that um, most brands, if they do have diverse talent, they are typically at the lower level positions. They are typically in positions that, um, you know, are forward facing, consumer facing. They're either stuck in um, a, a bucket called the multicultural division, which doesn't have a lot of leverage to get out of that division. So once you've worked in those positions for two to three years and have exceeded expectation, there's no pipeline for them to grow within the company. And so we want to look at how do we retain the, those employees, but then also promote them and push them into positions of management and leadership. And um, that's where the change makes. The change it honestly makes it at the top. And when you look at all of these organizations and you look at all of their executive leadership teams, um, it's typically a bunch of white men, old white men sitting at the top of these organizations. And we need to have some additional seats. It's fine that it's old white men that's sitting at that table, but there also needs to be women. And there also needs to be people of color of all races sitting at that table as well, helping to make organizational change for those companies. It's really about being more inclusive, having more equity. We look at job training opportunities. Like I said earlier, we have a great relationship with bartenders and with the bar community that um, are looking for opportunities and ways to get into these organizations, but may not be qualified to actually take on those roles as marketing director, as a sales rep, as on or off premise brand ambassador role. And so we are looking to partner with organizations to give provide training um, for them so that when those positions do come up, they can be prepared to apply and go within the organization. Um, and again, when it comes to recruitment, that taking taking a larger step back than it is looking at internship opportunities for college students. It is looking at how can we support the, the um, universities and the programs that are um, training diverse talent um, to become our next distillers. And um, how do we put, how do we position them for positions of mentorship and internship so that they can be prepared when they graduate and go into the, the industry as well? On that note, when I was talking with Fawn, she mentioned trying to recruit at the historically black colleges and universities and going mm -hmm. to their science departments and their engineering departments and uh, talking to their students about, uh, have you ever thought about getting into the distilling industry? There's opportunities here for you. And Absolutely. maybe one out of a hundred kids had even thought about it. Exactly. Exactly. Because again, it's not on their radar. And we see this in other areas, right? So like the students who come out of Wharton or the students who come out of Yale business or Harvard business, we know those students that come out, out of those programs, they are fast checked right up to Wall Street, you know? So they had, but it's just the way that the pipeline is set up for a college into corporations that they work with. I attended a historically black college um, in Florida. I went to Florida Agricultural Mechanical University. And when we graduated out of those programs, the majority of my colleagues and my classmates got hired by companies that had relationships with the university. So a lot of my friends went up to Cincinnati and worked for Procter & Gamble 
or for Eli Lilly. <laughs> a lot of them went to Medtronic in Minnesota or Target in Minnesota because those companies had invested in our in our college. So when and we're there for every single, you know, career fair for every single internship opportunity. And so when they knew those kids graduated from college, they had positions ready for them. But again, that's intention on the company side, on those brand side. And that's what we and that's what our industry needs to do. Adopt a HBCU and make sure that you are providing internships for those students. Make sure that you are going to their recruitment fairs, letting them know that there are open positions. So when they graduate, they can apply and go directly into those companies. Um, that is going to be crucial. That's a big part of our push as well. Um, for diversity distilled and just really being, again, that facilitator between the brands and the HBCUs um, to make that recruitment effort happen. Have you gotten any pushback at all since that letter went out? No. Good. No. But, you know, people ask me this all the time when I started Black Bourbon Society, did I get any pushback? The answer is no. The only pushback that I got might have been around budget. Um, <laughs> and we all know how that goes. And so when we started, you know, conversations about diversity distilled and, and launching as a formal organization in January, before that, we were in conversation with brands talking about this. And brands knew that they had to work on their DNI efforts. They were starting to make, you know, an effort by creating ERGs within their company. Um, they were starting to get consultants. Um, independent consultants, and they were starting to um, to establish a DNI position within their organization, which is huge. Like this has really been a new thing for some of the brands. Um, and and when we said, okay, we're doing diversity still, we want to do this conference, we want you on board. They were like, yes, let us know how can we support. But then COVID happens. And everyone's budget essentially blew up. <laughs> and it wasn't about spending or investing at that point. At that point, it was preserving positions within their company. So we did back up off of the conversations about funding and, 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 and working with Diversity Distilled. And so, of course, recent matters have happened and it's pushed it right back to the forefront. So seeing those brands say, yes, we know we've needed to do this. Oh, it's such a bad time financially, but we are committed and we will step up. We are making a statement to say that we will and we will follow up on our words. That is so powerful for me in this moment. Everyone's heart overall, and you, you and I know this in the whiskey industry, 90% of everyone's heart in this industry is in the right place. How could it not be? We're talking about whiskey, you know? <laughs> It's that 10% you got to watch out for. That 10%. Yeah. And, you know, I don't let those 10% get in my way. You know, we, we had the, the, the conversations the week before with American Barrels, but, you know, at the end of the day, they don't speak for 100% of our industry. We have included links for both the Black Bourbon Society and Diversity Distilled in the show notes for this episode at whiskeycast.com. A couple of things to follow up on from the interview, though. I inadvertently referred to the Kentucky Distillers Association's first auction as benefiting COVID-19 research. In fact, the proceeds will go to the state's Team Kentucky Fund to help people affected economically by the pandemic. As for the response from the KDA, I checked with the association after the interview. And there is more to it than just the current auction to benefit the Brianna Taylor Scholarship Fund at the University of Louisville and the scholarships that we mentioned during the news at the University of Kentucky's Beam Institute, along with the University of Louisville and Kentucky State University. There is also a task force that I mentioned during the interview that will include diversity experts from outside the industry. We also should note that the timing of the COVID-19 auction on Brianna Taylor's birthday was somewhat beyond the KDA's control, according to the association. They went through a period of having to get approval from the state to hold the auction in the first place that took a couple of months because of the pandemic. 
They finally got state approval to hold the auction and started it that very day, which happened to be Brianna Taylor's birthday. We have also included a link to the KDA's statement on its website in our show notes as well. That's Whiskey Cast in Depth, brought to you by Mortlock, whiskey's best kept secret. Hidden away for decades in some of the world's most famous Scotch whiskies, comes a single malt inspired by an original for a fortunate few. Discover the entire Mortlock lineup at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. Let's start with a couple of recent releases from Washington's Woodenville Whiskey. Their straight bourbon is distilled in a pot still, not a column still as most bourbon distillers use. It's bottled at 45% ABV. The nose has notes of charred oak, molasses, honey, brown sugar, and a hint of dark chocolate. The taste is spicy but well-balanced with hints of clove and black pepper, complemented nicely by honey, molasses, brown sugar, and a hint of anise. The finish is long with lingering spices balanced by a nice sweetness. I'm scoring Woodenville Whiskey's Straight Bourbon a 92. Now, Woodenville takes some of that straight bourbon and finishes it in port wine casks. The port wine cask finish is also bottled at 45% ABV, and there is a noticeable difference. The nose has notes of dried fruits, along with muted spices, a hint of oak tannins, honey, and vanilla. The taste has a good balance of dried fruits and spices, with clove and black pepper, but there are also hints of apricots and plums, along with vanilla and brown sugar. The finish is long and slightly tart, with a good balance of fruitiness and spices. I'm scoring Woodenville's Port Cask Finished Bourbon a 93. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first, this week's tasting notes are brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey and its new Brewer's Select Rye Ale Barrel Finish. It's a collaboration between Sagamore Spirit in Maryland and Sierra Nevada in California, where they filled Sagamore Spirit barrels with their red ale beer, then shipped the empty barrels back to Maryland to give Sagamore Spirit rye a unique touch. Look for it now at select retailers and get the whole story at sagamorespirit.com. One more bourbon, this one from High Wire Distilling in Charleston, South Carolina, which makes a batch of bourbon each year from locally grown Jimmy Red Corn that's unique to South Carolina. The 2019 release of High Wire's Jimmy Red Single Barrel Bourbon is bottled at 46% ABV. The nose is aromatic and spicy with hints of white pepper, oak tannins, sawdust, molasses, and a hint of honey. The taste is well-rounded with an intense flavor led by cinnamon, white pepper, and chili powder spices, balanced out by honey, molasses, vanilla, and a hint of oak. The finish is very long with spices that gently fade to reveal touches of red apples and molasses. This is a stunning whiskey that deserves a lot more attention. I'm scoring High Wire Distilling's 2019 edition of Jimmy Red Straight Bourbon, and 94. And finally, let's look at Stowning Whiskey's Vermouth Cask Finished Danish Rye Whiskey. It's bottled at 61.2% ABV. As you might expect, the nose is warm and spicy with notes of clove, honey, molasses, cocoa, and a hint of maple. The taste is thick, chewy, and spicy with black pepper, clove, and chili powder notes that fade to reveal hints of apples, cocoa, honey, and maple. The finish, long and mouth-watering with subtle fruits and spices. It's intense and full of flavor. I'm scoring Stowning's Vermouth Cask Finish Rye a 92. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. I'm adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of 2,900 different whiskeys from all over the world. Check it out this week at whiskeycast.com. The search never ends, but it's nice when you can come in for a landing. 
pause and explore the silky smoothness of single pot still Irish whiskey, matured in the finest bourbon and Oloroso sherry casks. Land on Redbreast, then be sure to pass it on. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. You might notice a little bit of natural sound in the background. Uh, birds, maybe a little bit of wind, uh, maybe a lawnmower or leaf blower in the distance. It's a beautiful day here in Haddonfield, the charming yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield. So I decided to bring my recording gear outside and sit out by the fire pit in the backyard after dinner to record this episode. But that's the reason for some of the background noise. Now, if the weather would actually cooperate one of these days, I might do the same thing for our Whiskey Wednesday webcast or our happy hour show on Friday. I hope you'll join us for this week's Whiskey Wednesday webcast. My guests will include master distillers Nicole Austin of Cascade Hollow in Tennessee and Heaven Hill Distillery's Connor O'Driscoll. We do the live webcasts every Wednesday and Friday at 5 p.m. New York time. That's 10 p.m. London time and 2100 GMT elsewhere in the world. You can watch the webcasts on the WhiskeyCast Facebook page, along with YouTube, Twitter, and Periscope. And if you missed our webcasts this week with Fawn Weaver, Brian Tracy, and Adam Spiegel on Wednesday, and the Friday night show with Deval Gandhi and Rachel Berry, you can always watch the replays on demand at our Facebook page and on our YouTube channel. Let's open up the inbox now for the calendar of events brought to you by Lot 40. Longtime listener Ken Goldenberg posted this comment on our YouTube channel following the Whiskey Wednesday webcast with Vaughn Weaver. Here's what he had to say. I love the narrative that is done by actor Jeffrey Wright on the Uncle Nearest website. In fact, when I first saw it, I thought he was part of the family. It was so well done. The genuine untold stories that are out there of the contributions of these people towards our American foods, drinks, and so much more need to be put out there for all. We all connect through food and drink much more than we know, and that's true all over the world. How many people right now, of all colors, even know who George Washington Carver was, let alone all the unsung enslaved heroes? I admit I have not yet tried Uncle Nearest, but my local trader Joe's has carried it for a while, so I need to pick some up. Cheers for a great episode, Mark and all. Thank you for the kind words, Ken. Now, we had an interesting question on Twitter from at Joseph Trotter V2 this week. I've at various points wanted to research the link between money made from slavery slash reparation to Scottish slavers and its investment into the Scotch whiskey industry in the late 18th, early 19th century. There is a lot sloshing around, I don't mean whiskey, which is never acknowledged. Turns out there is some research being done on that very question. Derek Bratt is working on his Ph.D. in archaeology at the University of the Highlands and Islands in Scotland, and tweeted that he's been researching the subject and added this. Keep your eyes peeled for an article in the coming months. Maybe not as bad as some industries, but certainly not innocent. I'll let you know when that article is published. Meanwhile, at Mike W. Simpson had this question on Twitter Sunday. A couple of questions for your next episode, or one down the road. One, have you ever tried bottling your own whiskey in a partnership or buying a barrel? Two, Can you think of a whiskey or bourbon that you wanted to try badly, but never got your hands on it? Looking forward to the next episode. Thanks, Mike. I have not bottled a whiskey of my own so far, and I don't think I'm going to be buying barrels anytime soon. If I did bottle a whiskey, it would be a one-time charity bottling. As for your second question, there have been many whiskeys that I've really wanted to try, but was never able to get my hands on a sample. Most of the time, that's because the distillery is not able to get its samples into the U.S., and I wasn't going to be traveling to their area where I could pick one up. Now, other times it's because the distillery decides for some reason to not make samples available to reviewers or limits them by region. 
There was one rare Canadian whiskey released a couple of years ago by a U.S.-based company that was only going to be sold in Canada. And when I requested a sample, I was told they were only providing samples to Canadian reviewers, even though we have many listeners in Canada. I may disagree with that approach, but it is their decision to make. I can't say one thing, though. I have never had a whiskey company yet that has cut me off from receiving samples after a bad review of one of their whiskeys. I'll give them all credit for that. Thank you for the questions, Mike. And if you have a question, a suggestion, or anything else you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always get in touch with us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at WhiskeyCast.com. Your voice is presented by Lot 40, Canada's 100% pot still rye whiskey. Lot 40, unapologetically Canadian. Please drink responsibly. Let's wrap things up now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and all those other things that make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. Lots of whiskey lovers think it would be really fun to be a whiskey blender, nosing and tasting whiskeys all day long and coming up with new blends. But there's a lot more to the job for many blenders than just nosing, tasting, and blending. For instance, Rachel Berry has to also manage the cask inventories for all three of Brown Foreman's distilleries in Scotland, which can be difficult to do when working at home, as she told me Friday before we started the Happy Hour webcast. There's some really strategic, serious stuff I've got to work through, um, as well as the touchy-feely stuff, which um, I I have done um, within the past year. So um, towards the end of last year, I was in Spain. So it's not that long ago with um, our partner there and um, selecting the wood, looking at the whole process and and, and really understanding it and um, developing, you know, a sustainable specification going forwards um, for quality. And, of course, we have some tremendous sherry casks um, for Glendronic. So it's really, really critically important. You know, we spend a fortune um, on our sherry wood. Um, and um, we buy, I think, the most um, Pedro Jimenez casts in the industry, and you know it's the king of sherries. So it's um, critically important. And obviously, I sample the casks after six months. Um, anyway, once new mates gone in or when they've been re racked, so I know very quickly, and it can be very agile um, to respond to any changes um, or you know um, any fluctuations um, there. Um, but yeah, I have to look at stock modelling a lot. So looking at the sales forecasts and also looking at our supply and working out, well, how many casts do I need to buy? As well as looking at, you know, how many are being disgorged and exactly what we want to fill going forward for the portfolio of ages. So it's quite complex, but it's great fun. Is that the hardest part of the job is balancing all these competing needs? It's the most fun part of the job. You know, I'm 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 a real problem solver. I like I'm like a you know Rubik's cube. <laughs> I love to join everything up, and it's for me it's it's so great fun to to connect the very analytical part of looking at supply and demand and 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 managing that, and then the creative part of um, exploration, experimentation, um, exploring flavor, exploring the technical aspects of um, the technology of production and then just bringing it to life through the individual character of a distillery and um, and what really makes it shine. So it it varies between distilleries. So um, obviously Glendronic, you know, sherry cast maturation, whereas um, Ben Reik is is, is much more the bourbon cast maturation with myriad of eclectic casks woven in. So it's great fun. It's great to have that diversity to work with, you know. It's... uh, Child in a species shop. As for monitoring the daily distillery production and the final blending samples for whiskeys to be bottled, a courier delivers samples of everything to Rachel's home for her to work with there. You can watch the rest of our conversation with Rachel Berry and Davil Gandhi from Friday Night's Webcast 
on our YouTube channel and our Facebook page. If you have something you'd like us to look at on an upcoming episode, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot, a unique triple distilled premium Irish whiskey combining single malt and single pot still. First fashioned in the 1700s and still a rarity today. Sure, as we say in Ireland, what's rare is wonderful. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find links for our Whiskey Cast HD videos and the Whiskey Cast Tasting Panel podcast, our live web streams, the latest whiskey news, my tasting notes, the calendar of events, the whiskey photo of the week, and of course, a complete archive of all of our past episodes. We love to hear from you no matter what. Get in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at WhiskeyCast.com. From far beyond the wall comes a whiskey for those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch Whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. When you land on something special, you just know. Redbreast, the quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey and a proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2020, and comes to you from the charming yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening, and please stay safe.